Welcome back to my channel. My name is Michael and welcome to another edition of my bookish life. In this episode, I'm going to talk about my August reading month. As most of you know, August was Women in Translation Month and this is one of my favourite times of the year. Thanks to Maytel or Biblio Bio for creating this social reading event and I really appreciate reading women in translations obviously but I really appreciate the social aspect that came with women in translations but there's so many people talking about books that I am interested in and that I like to read so I feel like this is what it must be like for people that read a lot of the more hype more popular books they've always got people interacting with them talking about books because a lot of people have read it they'll read those books and that's cool if that's what you want to read but that's not what I'm into so when it comes to this Women in Translation Month it gives me a look into that kind of world and I really enjoy seeing so many people talking about translations so I'm just going to talk about what I read and I'm going to start with the first book that I read in the month and that's Paradise Rock by Jenny Haval and this was translated by Marja Idris and if you know who Jenny Haval is then we should definitely be friends because she is amazing. I was sick at the start of August reading this book and probably not the best time to read it but I really really did enjoy this book and what it had to say it's a queer relationship as it develops but more importantly as it starts to break down and this is a very sensory disturbing book because it uses images of rotting fruit and mold growing in a bathroom to really hit home that relationship breaking down it's the metaphor the imagery that really makes this book interesting like you've got mold growing in the bathroom that's so bad that mushrooms are growing now and when you're sick that kind of imagery is a little hard to stomach but fascinating book really weird really interesting obviously not going to be for everyone but I had a lot of fun reading this and that is an amazing cover if you want to look at that I think it's a book I'm going to have to return to because I think there's something about it that would really work dipping in and out of it over and over again. Next, I read Not One Day by Anne Greta, and this was translated by Emma Ramadam. I've talked a lot about Anne Greta, and she's an Olympian author that likes to put restrictions on her writing. And with this, she had the restriction of Every day she's going to write an essay about a woman she's loved. For 30 days she's just going to write these essays about these women. As this book progresses, she kind of throws out the rules and that's what makes this really interesting. She plays around with her own restrictions and it's not the easiest book to talk about. It's just a collection of essays about these women and their relationships. but. Because I love Sphinx so much, which is her novel, I wanted to check this out. It's a tiny, tiny book, but I think if you're interested in Olympian writing and how people put restrictions on their own writing and even seeing that breakdown, then this is an interesting read. This was kind of a popular book a year or two ago, I think. This is The Impossible Fairy Tale by Hang. Yojo and translated by Jeanette Hogg and I really didn't enjoy this book. I think the problem is fairy tale retellings, those type of books really don't work for me. This is dark and disturbing, which is interesting, but it felt like it was written for a child and that kind of made it feel like I was being talked down to like everything was explained and Try to capture that childlike writing style just didn't sit well with me and yeah not really a book for me so might get rid of this book I don't know but I get that 
it kind of is experimental, like almost postmodern. But yeah, no, I don't like that kind of writing style. I read the second book in the Vernon Subjects trilogy by Virgie Depence, and this was translated by Frank Wayne. And, you know, this series is really interesting. It's set in the Paris underground, and you get a lot of references to punk music and music industry, and there's a bit of drugs, sex and alcohol, and all that kind of stuff. But I think she's developed an interesting narrative, and I think one of my problems with her other writing is she tries too hard to be transgressive and tries to be shocking. But here she's just trying to capture a lifestyle without trying too hard. So it works better. And because she set up the characters, a lot of that would happen in book one. So this had a bit more freedom to just continue on the story without having to do more setups and stuff like that. So I think I liked it better than the first book. But I did get annoyed that there wasn't as many musical references. There is actually a Spotify playlist of all the music referenced in the series, which is really good. It's got some great music on it. I then reread one of my favourites. I read this, I think, a year or maybe two ago, Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Riquez, and this is translated by Mika McDowell. This is an Argentine collection of short stories. I probably talked about this heaps and I'll probably continue to talk about this because I love this and it really worked as a second time around as well. I think she captures that horror style and uses that to explore ideas of violence towards women and how women are treated and I think there's so much to get out of this book and I'll probably reread this again in the future and probably read it over and over again. I just had an itch to return to it because a lot of people talk about Argentinian literature and they refer to Samantha Swepland and Fever Dreams. But this came out at the same time and I think this is heaps better. I appreciated this book more. I think it had more to say. And I love a collection of short stories that work together to tell a deeper kind of story it doesn't have to be intercollecting stories it could be these are all sharing common themes and it doesn't feel like they're slapping together stories to just fill out a collection and i really appreciate that so it was nice to return to a favorite i then read history a mess by sigrun padotta and that was translated by Burton smith and this is a really unique book it definitely stood out as one of the highlights of the month because of its uniqueness the basic plot is this the writer is researching for her thesis and she's reading this manuscript the manuscript gives her evidence that a famous 17th century artist was actually a woman so she writes out this 600 page thesis about one of these great artist being a woman and how that affects the art criticism and how that changes the world of art history and all this type of stuff. Like there's ideas of some of the paintings being a little cliche, but if it was written by a woman, that kind of changes the way you view the message and what it had to say. And she had this massive thesis and later she was looking through the manuscript again and discovered she had two pages stuck together and realized she had made a mistake but this was too late she couldn't do anything about the thesis now so she starts wrestling with this idea of do I expose myself as a fraud or expose the problem with my thesis or do I keep it quiet and it's a really humorous a little dark but funny little book that has a lot going on it has so much you could probably pull out of it but I really enjoyed it I thought it was very unique it kind of satirizes academia and research and how we view history and there's so many layers in there it's definitely a book I would 
recommend to people interested or working in academia because there's a lot of fun in that. Obviously, not going to be for everyone. It's definitely not the easiest read, but one that really stood out for me. Then I read a favourite of many people. This is Tuve Janssen, and this is a summer book translated by Thomas Thiel. I probably don't need to talk about this too much. It's a beautiful relationship between a grandmother and her granddaughter, and I really had great joy and great pleasure in reading this. It was just a nice little book to kind of sit in between some of the darker, heavier books that I was reading, and it was such a pure joy to read this. I talked about the 100 Best Women in Translation list, and this is one of the books that made the top 10. It was one of the books that I hadn't read when the list was out, but I picked it up straight away, and I really enjoyed it. There's another book about a grandfather and his granddaughter called Trick. It's an Italian book that kind of didn't work for me because I felt like the writing was a little cliche, a little basic. But I think in the hands of someone like Tuve, that kind of exploration in the relationship between a grandmother and a granddaughter is just done flawlessly. And I really need to read so much more of her books. Not my favourite, I still think True Deceiver is her best book, but I'm really glad I finally got to this one. The Weight of the World by Marianne Fritz, translated by Adrian Nathan West, is kind of like a forgotten classic German book that's exploring a domestic nightmare. It follows this young woman who's been traumatised by World War II and she's trying to get her life back on track. She's trying to get back into domesticity and into motherhood. But that trauma is still very relevant in her life. It still plays a big part of her day-to-day. And this is fascinating. There's this blend of wit, rage and humour that kind of plays out in this book and I kind of like that balance. I like that it's not too dark. I like that there's some anger in it and I like that she was able to keep that balance throughout the whole book. It's a modernist book, so if you like modernist writing, then definitely check this one out. I think it's well worth your time. Next, I read another Argentinian book. This was Optic Nerve by Maria Gainza translated by Thomas Bunston, and this is a work of autofiction, almost like short stories. Each chapter talks about a piece of art, it, like explains the art and goes into a bit of art criticism, but then the narrator the kind of relates that art to her life and starts telling the story of her own life, and it sounds so basic, it sounds like something simple, But when you think about the way she writes, it really must be a very difficult thing to pull off because trying to get that balance of criticism and intersecting her own life into it would probably be very difficult. And I feel like if I was to kind of describe her writing, I would say it's a combination of two different Argentinian authors, and that would be... Jose Luis Borges, the famous essayist and short story writer, and a more contemporary writer, and that's Paula Olorex. And she wrote a book called Savage Theories, which is exploring anthropology and the history of humans and our relationship with violence. So... If that sounds appealing, definitely check it out. This is a really interesting book and I really enjoyed it. More so after the fact that I've read it. I think just contemplating and thinking about this book was a much more pleasant experience than actually reading it because I wasn't sure where it was going to take me, but reflecting on it, I could just reflect on its brilliance. The last book I read was actually an audio book. I started reading another audio book, The Wall, which is a book that's been recommended to me over and over again, but I felt like it was too slow moving. So 
it wasn't working as an audiobook, so I switched it up and I read The Gravity of Love by Sarah Strasberg, translated by Deborah Bragan Turner. And I really love her other book, The Faculty of Dreams, which I've talked about over and over again. So I wanted to return to Strasberg. And this is an exploration into a psychiatric hospital, like kind of looking at the relationship of the patients and that kind of plot didn't really interest me too much. But under all it, it was looking at almost like the dehumanizing effects of psychiatric hospitals and the way they care for the mentally ill. So I found that really fascinating. I don't know much about that as a topic, but it's definitely one that I want to check out and research a little bit more, maybe read some more books on the topic. And I'm sure there's masses of books to read. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is one that came to mind. I've read and really enjoy. There's books like Girl Interrupted, which I haven't read yet. So there's probably lots I could do to explore that topic. Those were the books that I read in August. And in September, I'm pretty much going to continue reading more women in translation. There probably might be some other books in there. I have to read my In Real Life Book Club book, which is Too Much Lip. And that one of Miles Franklin, I believe, this year. So I definitely need to read that. And there might be a few others that I want to read, but I am keen to continue with the Women in Translation reading. I created a pile at the start of Women in Translation Month of all the priority books that I wanted to read. And I've been sticking to that lit pile mainly and trying to get that down. I'd love to have all those books read but I feel like sometimes that pile fluctuates with books getting put on the list as well so I'll see how that goes but I like to read on a whim so I just read whatever interests me at the time and see where that takes me. I'll probably stick to Women in Translations because I'm currently house sitting and I'll be house sitting for the rest of a month and those are the books that I have taken with me so those are the books that I'll make selections from. I do have my iPad, so I'll probably be reading some books from Script or the Kindle app and audiobooks, maybe. I haven't been reading many audiobooks. I mainly listen to podcasts at the moment, but I need to get into more of those just to increase my reading speed. So let me know what you thought in the comments if you've read any of those books. If you want to read any of those books, you've got any recommendations, anything, just let's have a conversation in the comments below. And if you want to find me elsewhere, all my links to social media are in the description. And as always, thank you for watching.